Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Melanin Margin, the weekly chat show where conversations about race are never off the table. We're your hosts, Quavi Andre Williams. And Daquan M-U-E. So let's get into this week's conversation. What's hot on the table this week? Actress Francesca Amewuda Rivers has been the latest to face racist backlash because of their casting. When Amewuda Rivers was announced to be cast as Juliet opposite actor Tom Holland's Romeo in a London West End production of Romeo and Juliet, many were quick to send racist criticisms of the casting. In an open letter published in The Guardian, over 800 Black women and non-binary actors signed their solidarity against the online harassment Amewuda Rivers and many other Black female performers face. The letter, initiated by actor Susan Wakoma and playwright Somalia Nonye Seton, states, quote, when news of Francesca Amewuda Rivers' casting in Jamie Lloyd's production of Romeo and Juliet was announced, many of us took to social media to shower our babysits with love and congratulations a huge deal for someone so young in their career, a huge rising talent. The racist and misogynistic abuse directed at such a sweet soul has been too much to bear. Too many times Black performers, particularly Black actresses, are left to face the storm of online abuse after committing the crime of getting a job on their own, end quote. The Romeo and Juliet producer Jamie Lloyd Company also released a statement condemning the racist reaction, stating, quote, following the announcement of our Romeo and Juliet cast, there has been a barrage of deplorable racial abuse online directed towards a member of our company. This must stop, end quote. With all that being said, Andre, why do you think the brunt of the hate is always directed towards actors, specifically Black actors, whose casting is out of their control? Um, I think there are multiple reasons, but the main reason is because they know they can get away with it. Uh, it's no secret that Black women are one of the most vulnerable people in our society, and the racists out there are aware of this and use this to their advantage when spewing their hate. And being that these racists are often cis, straight, white men and women, they know that they have more systemic power than Black women and are the most protected people in our society. We all know that bullies don't go after people who are stronger or on an equal playing field to them. No, they go after someone they see as vulnerable, someone they can overpower. And when we apply that, that knowledge to these racists, bullying Black actors for being cast in roles, we see that it's even worse because it isn't just the racists themselves going after the Black actors, but when they are rightfully called out for their hate, anti-Black people from different races will oftentimes come to their defense. And that's what makes this whole thing that much worse. I mean, thinking back to the Halle Bailey um, racist backlash at... Um, her being cast as Ariel in Disney's live action Little Mermaid, we saw just how quickly other races came to the defense of the racist. Some went even as far as saying that they understood why people were so upset at the casting, yet that same understanding couldn't be applied to the effect that this barrage of racist bullying um, had on the actor. Even worse, I distinctly remember people being upset at Hallie for calling out the racism. And they were saying things like, she shouldn't be upset that the racists were attacking her because she was, quote, messing up their childhood. And the exact same thing happened to Leah Jeffries, who was cast as Annabeth in Percy Jackson's uh, TV series adaptation. The racists were crying, screaming, throwing up, sliding down the wall when she said that Rick Riordan, the writer of the Percy Jackson series, told her that no matter what people say about her, to remember that he chose her. And they still claim that her casting ruined their childhood, even though the literal writer of the series stated that he picked her specifically 
for the role. But I digress. I think that another reason as to why Black actors get the brunt of the hate is because the racists are upset that the actor even auditioned for the role in the first place. It's almost like they're saying, how dare you even step foot into a role that isn't a maid, a slave, or a comic relief side character that has no plot line or character development. They don't want to hear our stories unless they are filled with trauma, pain, and suffering. And if you notice, the racists only ever speak out against the casting of a Black actor when said Black actor is playing a main role or a significant role in the story. And it doesn't matter that the story is completely fictional. It doesn't matter that the character's race has zero impact on the plot whatsoever. It, it doesn't even matter how talented the Black actor is. Racists don't want to see Black people on their screens because they use these fictional stories as an escape into a reality where Black people and people of color only exist as a tool for the white main characters to use and nothing more. But Daquan, I want to pass the question back to you. Why do you think that the brunt of hate is always directed towards the actors when, when their casting is not even in their control? I think so often they, and by they, I mean all of these racists because that's mm -hmm. what they are. These racists have been waiting for the opportunity. They are always in waiting for an opportunity to be racist. And because they often get called out for their racism, they like to use opportunities like these to disguise it. Because mm. for them, it's they're just caring about the story. They're caring about fear. They're caring about the integrity of the work. And to that, I say, who cares? This Romeo and Juliet is a story that has been told time and time again in so many different configurations. Shakespeare wrote it a very long time ago, and he is very much dead. So... <laughs> Juan. <laughs> so, like, why are we defending the dead person's play that they wrote a little, very long time ago? It's not as if having a Black actress play Juliet changes much to the story. It doesn't change the story at all. It's still the same story. And I would argue, as somebody who's read Romeo and Juliet, that I think it takes such an interesting turn and it has all of these interesting themes and layers when it is a Black actress as Juliet opposite a white actress, this theme of like forbidden love when it's this interracial couple is something that is so much more interesting than a standard white on white cast. And I think that another aspect of this scenario is that way too often people are letting their racism decide who is deserving of something. They're letting their racism judge everything. They are, whether they are outright saying this or not, they're saying that Black women don't deserve to be loved. They don't mm. deserve to be the one who is attractive and is the catch. They don't deserve to be in positions of being a lead in something. They don't deserve the spotlight or attention. They should stick to the sidelines. They should stick to the side characters and they should only be supportive tools. And it's so disgusting that that is what so many people think, but this is a situation that is even bigger than theater, even bigger than movies, TV shows, and all of that. This is something that we also see in sports. I mean, recently we had the USC Gamecocks when women's basketball team win the NCAA championship, and they did that with a undefeated record. They had their entire starting lineup changed at the beginning of the season and we're still able to pull out a great achievement yet all of the attention of sports media was on caitlin clark this white basketball player who 
is very talented, deserves a lot of praise for what she does, but the way that they're so quick to, you know, praise Caitlin Clark and talk about her and South Carolina's girls basketball team, who is primarily black, who has a black woman as a coach, gets pushed onto the sidelines because they're not deemed as being as interesting, even though they are making monumental achievements. Or when we have a player such as Angel Reese, who is somebody who is very dominant in the game, is very passionate about the game, they call her too aggressive and come up with all of these names to describe her, following in so many different stereotypes that people have of Black women, mm -hmm. when the same thing would not be held to a white basketball player doing the same things. So I think that it often comes down to racists want to be racist, but they don't want to be called out as racist. So they try to sneak in something to be camouflage. Like, well, to camouflage what they're doing. Yeah, and I agree. I also think that it's frustrating that the onus to call out the racist attacks of casting decisions often falls on the actor that was cast and not the production company who cast them. Most of the time, the production the production companies uh, behave from the stance of, if we don't say anything about it, it'll go away. And I've seen interviews with the directors of projects where the casting decision is vehemently attacked by racists, just don't even acknowledge the issue until they are called out to do so by those who are defending the actor who has been bullied. And here's the thing. Would it be nice if we lived in a society where we could cast a person of any race to play a fictional character and not have to worry about anyone being upset by that? Absolutely. But that world doesn't exist. <laughs> um, uh, and, and these production companies know from the get-go that their casting of a Black actor or an actor of color in a role would receive backlash, yet their silence until they are pressured to speak out against it is very telling. Now, before I say what I'm about to say next, I want to preface this by stating that I am in no way diminishing the talent of Black actors and actors of color cast in certain roles, but merely pointing out another factor co to consider. See, some production companies have realized that they have a serious problem with the diversity in their casting. Because of this, they will seek out talented Black actors and actors of color to cast in certain roles in order to beat the racism allegations. The problem is diversifying the actors you cast is a bigger deal than many of these production companies are aware of, specifically production companies that rarely include actors of color and Black actors in their storytelling. Expanding on what I uh, said earlier about racist white people using fictional stories as a form of escapism, when a production company has told almost exclusively white stories for decades, a large fraction of the audience that they have built expects that from every story that that company greenlights. Now, I'm not saying that every production company that casts Black actors and actors of color are using them as shields against racism allegations, but the ones that truly want to diversify their storytelling need to understand the gravity that comes with making progress like this. They have to stop being reactive to the backlash and start being proactive. Um, there needs to be statements accompanying these casting decisions that clarify that the studio is standing 10 toes down for the actor they chose and that any hate directed at these actors will not be tolerated whatsoever. And not only that, but there needs to be statements of support from the other actors working with them, as well as the director of the project. There needs to be a team that works on social media pages that ensures that any racist tweets, comments, and replies are blocked and deleted swiftly. Even if they can't stop people from making their own videos and tweets about the actor, they at the very least need to make sure that those comments don't make it into the main page of the actor or the studio page for the project. The point is there needs to be tact 
and care when casting a talented actor of color and black actor in certain roles, because whether we want to acknowledge it or not, racism is alive and well, and these actors should not have to face it alone. Their talent speaks for itself, but these racists yell from the rooftops how much they don't want them to be there. But Daquan, what do you think? Do you think their production companies should be more vocal and take a firm stance against racism of their performers face? Absolutely. I think not only should they do it, but they should do it to the umpteenth level. <laughs> right. Go above and beyond. Like you say, stand 10 doubt toes down. Right. Make sure that it's known. We made this decision. We stand by it. None of y'all can change it. And if you <laughs> don't like it, you ain't got to watch it. Sucks to be you. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Oh, well, boo-hoo, cry. <laughs> like, it should be something that they are very cognizant of. Because yeah. let's be real. A lot of these companies like to use diversity and inclusion. Be like, we're so diverse and inclusive and we're putting in the work. We care about different communities and we care about these issues, but they only go to the surface, right? Yes. Casting is a surface level, you know, solution to issues of diversity and inclusion. Yeah. It gives more representation, sure, but you need to go much deeper to get at the root of so many problems. Get to the root. You, the root. <laughs> the root. <laughs> and I think that when you cast somebody in a position like this, you should know that this is going to happen. Because yeah. we've seen it so many times. We see it even for fictional fan castings of uh rapunzel girl that, girl girl what? <laughs> the a fan cast and y'all are sending the actress hate girl yeah. get real yeah but this is something that so many companies should expect and be proactive about how they're going to handle this situation mm -hmm. they should be briefing their social media teams beforehand on how they're going to monitor and respond to and delete and block certain people in comments they mm -hmm. should go to the actors and actresses on set and let them know that they have resources that mm -hmm. are available to help mm -hmm. them deal with the hate mm -hmm. because it's easy to say oh well you're you're an actress you signed up to be criticized nobody signs up for racism right nobody signs up for misogyny bigotry at all that does not come with the job. That is no. in nobody's job description. No. And so companies should realize what's going on and be sure that there are resources for these actors and actresses to have the support that they need in situations like these. And they should be able to stand firmly on their decisions. I'm not even gonna say they need to give rationale. They just need to be like, we made this decision if you don't like it, womp womp. Like, it. <laughs> and I think that also what a lot of companies need to do is be more thoughtful of their yeah. casting. I think that they just, there are times when they just kind of do it on a whim and yeah. they don't do a lot of, without thinking about all the ramifications not only for that actress or actor who has to deal with that hate, but all of the future generations who are watching it. Right. So that they need to be able to send a signal to younger generations, younger actors and actresses to let them know, yes, this may be happening. We see the hate just like you do, but we are making sure that this doesn't happen. We are stopping it we are going to continue to try to stop it in the future. And mm -hmm. we are dedicated in investing in the future generation to make sure that they are supported as they're coming into the industry. Because this is something that can be very detrimental to somebody's career. They can think that they are getting their big break, that finally they're making it. And when they want to celebrate, when they want to have this achievement, they can only look at it through the lens of all the racism and misogyny mm -hmm. that they see with it. And that's 
tragic. Absolutely. In an article on BBC written by Christine Rowe, we learned that compliments can actually have a negative impact on one's self-esteem. According to Associate Professor of Developmental Psychology at the University of Amsterdam, Eddie Bromelman, inflated praise, quote, can actually deepen a cycle of low self-esteem, even if it's intended to combat it, end quote. Moreover, many times compliments can be received as inappropriate, such as appearance-based compliments or even stereotypical, such as calling a Black person articulate. Research has shown that, quote, both men and women who received appearance-based compliments subsequently did much worse on math tests and inappropriate compliments increased anxiety and depression levels in women, end quote. Not only have compliments been shown to worsen mental image and performance, but compliments can even break trust. Brummelman suggests that, quote, Inflated compliments from teachers can signal that they have low expectations of certain students, such as those from low socioeconomic backgrounds, and are praising lavishly to overcompensate. Preschoolers, when they see that teachers praise lavishly, regardless of the quality of their work, they start trusting their teachers praise less, end quote. So, Dequan, I wanted to ask you, how do you handle compliments, and has it changed over time? Girl, that's a question. That's a question. Look over there. <laughs> I would say that I've gotten better as time went on. Mm -hmm. It, for me, was something I didn't like as a child. Mm -hmm. And even now, to a certain extent, it's kind of eh. But especially when I was younger, I hated receiving compliments in front of the class. If it was like a one-on-one -on -one or like a more intimate setting, like if I was talking to a teacher one-on-one -on -one and they gave me a compliment, I could deal with that. I could process yeah. that, enjoy it. You know, it felt good enough for it being a compliment. But in front of an entire class, girl, not for me. Get somebody That's, else to do it. Get, get somebody, somebody else to do it. I don't need it. I don't <laughs> want it, girl. You could keep it. Um, <laughs> because for me, I didn't like being in the spotlight. Mm. And having that level of attention on me in front of everybody felt embarrassing. It made me feel self-conscious because I was already self-conscious about a mm. lot of things. I was a big black kid who was queer and had all of these different mannerisms that people may have called sus. And so it was something where when I was younger, I was hiding a lot. And so I never wanted the spotlight on me like that. And so I definitely resonated with the article in terms of how it showed how, you know, it can really worsen somebody's self-confidence and self-image and self-esteem when they already have issues with that. But I would say that I definitely have improved in many ways. I can take a compliment now. It still can be a little awkward at times, but I think that's more just like social anxiety being like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to respond to this. Like, do I say thank you? <laughs> I don't want to sound conceited with my thank you. Like, how do I phrase the thank yeah. you? But a lot of times I'm like, okay, this is me overthinking it and I can rationalize it and just come with a thank you or some type of response yeah. and kind of get over it. So compliments now do feel a lot better. I can take it in many more different situations. And so it's definitely something that I had to actively work on, though. But let me pass it back to you. How do you handle compliments? Um, I suppose it depends on the compliment. I've always just said thank you. However, when it comes to compliments on my acting, that's definitely shifted over time. Uh, when I first got into acting, I was uh, a high school sophomore, and I had a very encouraging drama teacher. She was very much so the type of teacher that really gassed you up. And I'm not even going to lie to you, bitch. I believed it. Um, baby, she made me think I was one of one, honey. So my The only skills, one. The only one, bitch. So my acting skills, you know, they pretty much stayed stagnant for a while. And that is until midway through my junior year of high school where I had to change schools. 
Now, naturally, when I got to, you know, my new school, I requested to be in a theater class. And when the teacher told us all to prepare a monologue for an assignment, I was fully prepared to go up on that stage and eat the girls up. I mean, I went up there, said my slate, did my monologue and waited for the applause. And while my classmates did clap after I was done, I stood on that stage with a broad smile on my face, waiting to hear the teacher tell me just how amazing I was. And baby, he let me have it. I'm talking about note after note after note after nerd. Girl, he had me standing there shook because my first theater teacher gave me all the compliments on every performance, but she never really gave me any notes. So I just assumed I always had it in the bag. But this new, this new teacher humbled me with a quickness. I was never arrogant, but I definitely was a little overconfident in my skill set. And it wasn't until this teacher that I learned that no matter how talented you think you are, there is always room for improvement. Every performance I gave this teacher after that first one, he made sure to give me plenty of notes, which I quickly applied. And not only did he help me learn how to take constructive criticism, but his notes made me into a much better actor. It wasn't until I had my final round of auditions um, for an honors theater program that he gave me my first compliment. You know, I'd run this monologue about two or three times in front of him. And I was, you know, being particularly hard on myself that day. And he sat me down and told me that he doesn't like giving compliments to actors he works with because that's not what they need. He said that he already knew I was a good actor for my very first monologue I performed for him, but he pushed me and pushed me because he knew I had it in me to be a great actor. And that's when it all clicked for me. You know, he taught me how to both be confident in my skills while also being open to being better. And that lesson he imparted didn't just help me as an actor, but in every venture that I embark on. I mean, even in my writing, whenever I ask for feedback, I tell people not to mince words or sugarcoat their critique because while I am confident in my storytelling, I'm also aware there's always room for improvement. There are always things that other people will see that I just can't because I'm too close to the work that I created. Being great at what you do isn't just about your natural skills. It's about always looking for ways to grow and improve. But Daquan, you know, since we're on the topic of how compliments affect us, I wanted to ask you, have you ever given or received a compliment that you felt was inappropriate or demeaning? Mm, yes. However, I'm going to come back to that. Because oh, you'll come back to <laughs> I'm going to come back to that because okay. I do need to talk about getting compliments for your arts. Okay. Your <laughs> because... I just have to say, I'm so glad you said that because thinking now, I do recognize that there is a difference on how I receive compliments when it is something that's like, you know, writing or makeup mm -hmm. or anything creative that I do, or even just like my academic work yeah. versus, you know, other things like getting a compliment at work for like the work that I do that I, I'm not going to say I don't care about, but <laughs> a job is a job. Uh, the check is clear. That's all that matters. <laughs> but I, the check clears. Um, but I think that the main difference comes from I, there are certain avenues that I want to get better at and I want to continuously grow and mm -hmm. achieve more with my craft, whatever creative avenue I'm pursuing at the time. And so when I do receive compliments, there is that part of my brain that's like, is this person just being nice? <laughs> because I write a lot of things that are great. Like, I will be honest, this is not being arrogant or overconfident. I do write some things that are really good. That you're like, I cleared that. <laughs> Right. And I can acknowledge that you've also written things very good. We, we see each other. Thank you. But, we see we see we see each other. <laughs> right. But I've also written things that I'm not going to lie. Hot garbage. Same. Should not same. be read. Should not be looked at ever. Zero again. stars. Zero stars. Zero stars <laughs> would not recommend. And so I always come into the mindset of just like 
is this really this good or is it just you're being nice to me? And I yeah. think especially when the praise is so high, yeah. I don't know how to take it as much as something where the praise is a lot lower, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. But going back to the question, um, of course I have been <laughs> given compliments <laughs> that were very inappropriate and stereotypical because I was that kid that got told a lot, oh, you're so articulate, you're so smart, and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, am I not supposed to be? Were you not? <laughs> you speak so clear. That? Like, is you am so I well. supposed to sound a certain way, look a certain mm -hmm. Like, what were you expecting from me? And I know that that's not always the intent. Yeah. But we have to realize once again that intent always don't mean, doesn't mean everything. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily how you intended to say something rather than the impact that it actually had. Yeah. And so I think that when I did get those compliments, it really made me feel bad about myself because it's like wait am i doing something wrong am i doing mm. something different like because i already didn't like being put in the spotlight before but now i'm like because again it's this issue of like am i not supposed to be am i just like are you praising me just because mm -hmm. or like the article said like are you giving me this lavish praise because you have so low expectations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you have these low expectations, am I just meeting them? Am I exceeding them? Am I really doing it? It's yeah. just so hard. So many levels, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've definitely received demeaning compliments before. One that comes to mind uh, is when I was in high school talking to one of my friends and you know, some random girl just kind of slipped into the conversation and started laughing every time I said something. Now, at first I thought, Oh, she was laughing at the story I was telling because it was pretty funny. You know, the, you know, pretty, it was pretty funny the story that I was telling. And then she said, oh, my gosh, how are you doing that with your voice? And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, oh, how are you making your voice sound like that? It's hilarious. How do you do that? Like, do you do that to be funny? And I just looked at her <laughs> and said, I'm not doing anything to my voice. This is just how I sound. And she would not let it go. She just kept telling me to stop and that there was no way I actually sounded like that and just kept laughing in my face. And my friend and I both looked at each other like, is this bitch for real? <laughs> and I had, to, I had to tell this girl a second time that this is just my normal speaking voice and that I'm not doing anything to make my voice sound different. And then she stopped laughing and sort of just like walked away. But yeah. That created a whole new insecurity for me moving forward about how my how I sound, especially considering the fact that my voice still sounds the same way it did. Um, also, part of the reason why I've decided never to talk about my struggles in, in being single with people in relationships is because I always get those demeaning compliments where they are always like, no, you're a catch. You just have to learn to love yourself first and feel that loneliness up with you. Learn to have Gag. fun with yourself. Uh, Ew. And, bitch. I and hate I, those. I swear. I swear. This shit gets on my last fucking nerve because it's like, what makes you think I don't love myself? <laughs> Like I said this before on the podcast, but like self-love is a lifelong practice. Whether you're with someone or not, you will always have to practice self-love and loving yourself. We're always changing and always growing. So we'll always have to practice self-love in order to learn how to love ourselves at every point in that journey. And don't even get me started on the enjoy. You have to enjoy being by yourself. You have to share you with you. That bullshit people love to say, bitch, all I have is me. So of course I have fun alone. It's not like I have much of a choice in that department. In the words of Miss Eartha Kid, baby, I fall in love with myself and I want someone to share it with me. I want someone to share me with me. But Daquan, what do you think about that? Girl, I hate those comments. <laughs> because 
they think that they're doing something. They, they think, think they really clear it. Encouraging <laughs> that they're clearing the plate. But <laughs> let me tell you, the whole buffet is still there. It's still <laughs> on that plate. Like, you haven't eaten not nary a piece of anything. But I think that it's also the situation where oftentimes people expect that that kind of language is fishing for compliments. Mm. Like, I think that there are people who like to call themselves ugly or, you know, yeah. hate that they're single and complain about being single because they are fishing for compliments. And I think that that happens often enough that people kind of expect it. And they're like, well, like, you look like you need a compliment, so let me give you a compliment. Versus rather, sometimes I am just venting to vent, girl. Right. Sometimes it just gets to you, like, yeah, God, like what is going on? Like the people are not peopling. There's <laughs> nobody around. There's nobody. Like it gets rough, and sometimes you just want to get that out there to another person for yeah. them to empathize with you yeah. rather than kind of give you this sympathy compliment. And it's- Or it really, unask for advice, or what is it? Unauthorized or, advice? Mm -hmm. What is the word I'm looking for? Like- um, I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, but, but know you know what I'm trying to say. You know, you know what direction right. I'm going, yeah, yeah. But I think that it's also- Unwarranted, unwarranted. So unwarranted, unwarranted advice, advice. Yeah. yeah. It's also a situation where it can uh, oftentimes create this kind of power dynamic that I don't think mm. a lot of people think about. Because if you are the friend in the relation who's already in a relationship, has a loving partner, and you're looking to your single friend, it's just like, you just, you just got to love yourself. <laughs> Meanwhile, you've been in a relationship forever. Forever. You've almost never been single for longer what? than like a week. <laughs> like that is not, I say this with all the love in the world, but maybe you're not the best person <laughs> to be giving advice <laughs> in this situation right. when you're not fully versed on the situation itself. And it can also create a power dynamic, even in the more like stereotypical, like, oh, you're so articulate, you're so smart, because it's kind of like, you are beneath me in a way, mm. and I am giving you this praise to help boost you up a little bit, because you're down low there, and I'm giving you this sympathy and pity, and it's like, girl, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want your sympathy, I don't want your yeah. pity, I don't need it, I love myself. I enjoy the things that I do. Mm -hmm. I think that I do great things. And so I don't need the just all of that. I need somebody to listen to me, to empathize with me, to hear what I'm saying versus making assumptions about what I mean. And I think that that's another thing what I try to do with a lot of my friends. And you know this, Daquan, too. I always try to ask, like, what do you need? What are you reading right now? Do you just want to vent? Do you want advice? Do you want to just talk about it, cut the shit tea with each other about it? Like, what are you looking for? Because I always think that that's a great way to um, kind of judge where the conversation needs to go. Because like you said, sometimes we're not looking for answers. We're not looking for, you know, solutions because we probably already know what the answer is. We probably already are practicing the things that you're going to give us a quote unquote advice about. But that's not what I wanted from you. I just wanted to empathize and say, girl, it's fucking sucks a little bit. Like, oh God, like da da da. And you're like, oh, no, no, you're great. You just have to wait. It'll happen naturally, organically. Like, girl, shut the fuck up. Girl, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, so yeah, like I, I fully agree. I think that it's just it's frustrating and it's irritating when you know people don't seem to understand that sometimes it's not about like. Oh, I'm looking for advice, or I'm looking, or I'm fishing for a compliment. I'm just looking to say I'm fucking, I'm frustrated, and I want to voice right. those frustrations. According to CNN, new research shows that quote Gen Z people who are 18 to 26 years old are less likely to rate their lives positively than older generations when they were the, in that age range. End quote. The study found that one of the most important factors 
correlated with Gen Z's sense of happiness is having a sense of purpose. Quote, what is important to Gen Z is whether they feel like their life matters and they're making a difference more so than am I going to work making a ton of money, getting a big promotion, things like that, end quote, said senior researcher at Gallup, Zach Kurnowski. Clinical psychologist Dr. Broderick Sawyer describes purpose as, quote, pursuing things that deeply connect with one's sense of self. In essence, developmental years need to feel like they are going somewhere rather than useless, aimless, or aligned with social or parental expectations. Purpose doesn't have to center around a job either. It can be about causes you support or the relationships you form, end quote. So Andre, I wanted to ask you, do you feel like you know your purpose or are you still figuring it out? If you would have asked me this question a few months ago, I would have told you with absolute certainty that I knew exactly what my purpose was. A few months ago, I had my entire plan laid out. I knew where I was going, what I was going to do, and how I was going to do it. I was confident in the knowledge that I was very close to being on the road to not only living in my purpose, but fulfilling my purpose. I knew that all the hard work, time, and energy I put into what I thought I was destined to do was finally going to pay off for me. All the struggles that I endured up until that point were going to be the basis for the motivational speeches I'd make once I was finally on the other side of the hard times and living in my destiny. Bitch, I wasn't wearing rose-colored glasses. No, no, no. I had rose-colored contacts in so that every corner of my vision was filled with my delusion, okay? <laughs> I lived my life with the idea that things would work out much in the same way that TV shows and movies do. There was the goal of the main character, you know, that they wanted to achieve, the obstacles that they would have to overcome and learn from so their happy ending would be hard-earned and well-deserved. And I believe that I was that mean character and that it was my time. It was time for me to finally reach my well-earned happy ending. But that didn't happen. Um, instead, the thing I worked so hard for, the thing that I fought tooth and nail to get, the star I reached so high up in the sky to grab was unfortunately too far out of my reach. I thought that because I try my best to be a good person and do the right thing that the world was bound to give me a reward at some point. But that's not how the world works. You don't get brownie points for doing the right thing. You're supposed to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because you think you'll get something out of it in the long run. I had to come to a place of acceptance, knowing that life isn't always fair. And just because you want something really fucking badly, doesn't necessarily mean that you'll always get it. I knew the risk I took in going for my original goal. For some, it works out. For others, it doesn't. For me, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. That doesn't mean that the work I put into it didn't matter. That, does, that also doesn't mean that I'm not talented or good at what I do. It just means that this particular goal I had didn't work out. Because I had wrapped so much of my identity in that goal, the grief of not being able to reach it after all this time was devastating. However, I had to pick myself back up, dust myself off, and pivot. And life is kind of bittersweet in that way. Sometimes you reach for a goal and you're able to find the ladders and elevators that get you close enough to reach it. And other times, no matter how hard you push, some doors aren't meant to be open for you. And that's hard. It's sad, but that's life. So to answer the question, no, I don't really know what my purpose is in life anymore. Not like I thought I did. So now I'm back to the drawing board, hoping to figure out what it truly is. But Daquan, I want to pass it back to you. What do you think? Ooh, 
Woo! Mm, girl, this is this is something that I had to think a lot about because it's something that I honestly don't think about often. Or I should say, I do think about often, but in a more negative context. So about a year ago, I had a death in my family and it really hit me hard. And during that time, I felt like beforehand I had purpose and drive and I was grinding to do so many different things. And then in that moment, my world kind of stopped. And it was so hard for me because I think that when you are approached by death or death is around you, it can make things feel very heavy and it can bring you to a dark place because grief does that. Mm -hmm. And so there was a long time where I had a purpose and it was gone. It was lost for me. I was looking around the world thinking how unfair it is and thinking all of these different negative thoughts about like, what's the point? We're all going to die and none of this is going to matter. And so it took me quite a while to pull myself up out of that place. Because I think too often we think of purpose as being this big overarching thing, that it's this grand dream that's going to change the world. And for me, that was what it was. I had a grand dream that I was going to change the world and I was going to do so many different things using my platform for, you know, all of this creativity, getting a huge platform and also sticking with my academic work and really making a difference in so many aspects, being an activist, making a big difference in the world. And then that happened and I just kind of lost any drive to change the world when I knew that I needed help first. I can't help anybody else if I still need help. It's the whole, you can't pour out of an empty cup uh, mentality. Mm -hmm. And so I think now I'm more in a place of similar to like my vision. I can kind of see without my glasses, but when things are so far, it gets really fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that my purpose is something that I have a broad idea I think that somewhat I my purpose is to create, is to bring about some sort of creativity or knowledge into this world and disseminate that to people. But what that looks like on a day-to-day -day level or what that looks like tangibly, I'm still figuring it out. And it's hard to say that because I think way too often we kind of expect people to already know their purpose. Yeah. I mean, we're sending kids to college at 18 being like, you need to major in something that you're going to do for the, rest, the rest of, of your life. life. Yeah. And it's a huge decision that you're making so young. And so I've really had to grapple with that, say that it is okay for me not to fully know what my purpose is broadly, but find solace in the fact that there can be smaller things that I have purpose for. Like I have purpose for the videos that I'm creating, the learning that I'm doing, or I, I think that another thing is it's also important to remind yourself that purpose can change. Your purpose when you're 15, isn't going to be the same as your purpose when you're 20, 25. And I don't think that your purpose needs to be this goal that you fulfill. I think that sometimes your purpose is to fail. It's to take a risk, to take a chance, to put your all into something 
and learn that, okay, I tried my best and it didn't work out, but I enjoyed doing it. I was passionate. I was happy doing that. And that was a very hard lesson for me to learn. But Andre, I wanted to ask you, what do you do when you feel like your life is not aligned with your purpose? Um, I think that when you feel like your life is not aligned with your purpose, you have to make some tough decisions. Um, depending on what your purpose is, you have to ask yourself if you're doing all the things that you can to align your life with the goals you're trying to achieve. But you also have to understand that certain things take time. Certain goals, no matter how much work you do, can only be achieved through the passage of time. Um, you also have to be aware of the things that cannot be changed. You can only control the factors in your life that are within your power to change. However, there are certain things that are out of your control, so you have to accept that. There is also a question to ask yourself, and I think it is, are you willing to accept a reality in which you may not be able to live in your purpose in the exact way that you envisioned it? Um, because the thing that many people sometimes forget, myself included, is that your purpose isn't necessarily your career or some tangible thing like you brought up that you can reach out and grab and say, this is it. This is my purpose. It's more of a concept, a feeling, if you will. Like a purpose isn't something as simple as wanting to be an engineer, for instance. A purpose, I think, just like I think the article pointed out and you pointed out, is something more along the lines of, I'm meant to help people through my creations, or I'm meant to help those who cannot help themselves, or I'm meant to help people see the world through a different lens. And the reason I think that these examples are a more accurate description of a purpose is because they are so broad. Each of those examples could be applicable to hundreds, if not thousands of different career or life paths, which is why I had to reevaluate what my purpose was because I tied my purpose to a specific goal that if I didn't achieve that very specific thing, it would mean that I wasn't living my purpose. And when you tie your purpose to an achievement or to a tangible physical thing that is wholly dependent upon factors that are outside of your control, you can lose your sense of self very easily, just like I did. So when you're trying to align your life with your purpose, you have to be actively working towards finding what that purpose truly is outside of the narrow idea that you've bound it to. You know, find the root of what your purpose is. And once you find that, you'll discover the multitude of ways that you can live out that purpose, as well as find ways to align your life to match it. But Daquan, I mean, what do you think? Uh, what do you do when you feel like your life is not aligned with your purpose? I think that one of the only things you can do is reflect, is to sit down with yourself and ask those questions that I'm not going to lie, is so uncomfortable to think about because there are these big questions that society expects you to have an answer to just like that. But it's so much harder than that. And I think that you have to ask yourself is your life not aligned with your purpose or is your purpose not aligned with your life? And what I mean by that is I think that so often we think that our purpose has to be, like you said, this tangible thing, that there's this achievement mm -hmm. that I must have. And right now I'm not pursuing that achievement in any way. But rather you have to think, what are the things in my life that do bring me pleasure, mm -hmm. that do make me happy, that make me feel like I'm doing something, that make me feel like I'm moving forward rather than letting life just pass me by? And 
you have to think about those things. And then sometimes you can find a purpose through that. Mm -hmm. It's not always going to be this situation where you have your purpose in mind and then you make your life reflect it, but rather you live your life, you experience different things, and then you sit back with yourself and say, well, based off of what I've experienced so far, I think I know what my purpose is now. And it really comes down to that. I think that we have this mentality so often that we only have to do things or experience different experiences that are aligned with our purpose because we have that purpose just like automatically. Rather than sometimes you have to go through something in order to know what you want to do. You have to have this challenge in your life that makes you think, wow, this is something that really challenged me. And I'm sure that it challenges a lot of other people. And so I want to work to uh, overcome that challenge and maybe even help other people overcome that challenge. So it comes down to a lot of reflecting, a lot of asking yourself questions. And ultimately, you have to be comfortable with not having a purpose for a while. Because mm. it's not going to be something that you can just answer and come to. And then the next day, you're already acting within your purpose. Yeah. No. Sometimes, let's be real, you need to make a check. You need to put <laughs> yourself, you need to yourself, put clothes in your bag, yeah. and you might not be able to do all the work for your purpose. Not saying that your job has to be your purpose, but maybe you don't have the time or energy to support different causes that you want to or do the things that you want to do after work. And so you need to find a place where you are safe now to reflect and make those changes and once you come to an idea of what your purpose is, then you can go out and make the changes that you need to, rather than making changes blindly and kind of making a purpose on a whim. Now the table is always hot with current events and social issues, but sometimes the heat can get a little intense. Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Let's turn the temp down. Take a breather and get into this week's topic cool down. Andre, what do you have for us this week? So Daquan, to lighten the mood a bit, uh, mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite movies and why? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> because I'm going to be honest. I don't watch a lot of movies. Really? I want to, but I don't. I don't know. I just... When I was younger, I just never had the, like, interest going oh, to the okay. movies. Or, like, girl, let's be honest, there was some times where it was struggle bus, and I was like, I, I want to see this movie, but I ain't got the fun. So right. <laughs> that was before I really knew the internet. And it was like, yeah, I, could, I, could, I could figure something out. I could figure something out. <laughs> right. But I think that some of my favorite movies have to be just movies that really – made me think or made me happy or made me just have fun mm -hmm. um one movie that i loved loved love love was if beale street could talk mm. um it's it was such a beautiful movie it's such a beautiful book if you read it it's just it's one of those movies that will make you feel things and make you really think about the situations that people are in life um similarly one of something that was my favorite movie for a long time was the pursuit of happiness i saw it when i was i don't know i was pretty young mm -hmm. but i remember watching it and being like wow like seeing this father you know do all of this for the his child and just the struggles and trying to come over these obstacles. It was something that just felt very special for me. I think mm -hmm. that that's something that 
means a lot, especially if you come from a background where maybe your family don't doesn't have the most um, and you have certain struggles growing up, just seeing that reflected and seeing a kind of happy moments is really relieving and it just helps you so much. Um, other than that, I love cartoon movies. I love like cartoon movies of TV shows, like yeah. any of the Scooby Doo movies. Bitch, girl, they bitch, down. Jeez, every <laughs> I will watch them every single. Bitch, I watched them today. The fuck, girl. I watch them now. Like if I want to watch a movie, I'm going to watch the Hex Girls. Girl, bitch, that I know them songs by heart. <laughs> I will replay that over and over and over again in my head. But I think that those were really special for me because, like, these were shows that I loved watching growing up. And yeah. seeing them in this longer form really just made it even more special. And I got to, rather than this quick 30-minute episode, really enjoy these characters for an hour, hour and a half, two hours even. Yeah, It, it was just so fun. So those are some of my favorite movies. But what about yeah. you? Um, okay, now, so even though I came up with a question, this is a real hard one because if there's mm-hmm. one thing to know about Quavy Andre Williams, bitch, I fucking love TV shows and movies. All right, like mm-hmm. I can it, account, I can attest to that. You can att- <laughs> I'm telling you, it's my favorite form of content. So it was really hard to narrow down. <laughs> So I just decided to do my top three favorite movies, which mm-hmm. Daquan low-key just did without even thinking. Like, you just did right. that. Like, bitch, because we're here with it. Because we're here with right. it. Um, but that first, was up, right. That was planned. <laughs> but first up, um, I have to say is Inception. Um, one of the main reasons as to why I love this movie is because of how the writer plays with the concept of dreams versus reality. And there are so many directions that a person can go in when tackling a concept as complicated as dreams. And I feel like the writer and director do a really, really amazing job with pulling such a broad concept into a neat little theatrical package. Um, Up next uh, would have to be The Lost Boys. That fucking movie is so great to me because of its use of practical effects and the way it was directed. I could go into an entire TED Talk about all the different ways that this movie cleared the plate. But for now, I'll talk specifically about the scene in this movie that made it my fa- one of my favorite movies. And honestly, the scene, I think, is one of the best in cinema like I've ever seen so far. Um, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched The Lost Boys, I mean, it was an 80s movie, so I'm pretty sure, you know, but I'm not really spoiling, but just in case. Um, there is one scene where one of the main vampire antagonist's friends is staked through the heart, and he goes to chase after the kids responsible, but they run out of the cave into the daylight. And the vampire grabs onto the kid's leg just before they escape, and the arm is dragged into the sunlight, and it burns him. He stretches his hand away, watching as the kids run away, and a single tear escapes his eye as he looks on and he says, the night. And he chuckles before moving back into the shadows of the cave. Now, the reason why I fucking love this scene is because of the levels in it. The tear that the actor shed was not scripted for the character. The actor's eyes were just irritated due to the yellow contacts he was wearing, but the director chose to keep it in and it made the movie even better. Firstly, it humanizes this, I mean, monstrous looking vampire by having him shed a tear that could either be interpreted as him feeling the pain of the burning, of the getting burned by the sunlight, or him expressing grief at losing his friend, just losing him, or a combination of both is what I think it was. Also, when he says the night and starts chuckling, it's so fucking sickening because the kids cannot hear him. He's saying it to himself, almost as if he's calming himself down with a promise that he'll kill them at nightfall. And then the chuckle at the end shows his eagerness to avenge his friend. Like, bitch, chef's kiss, bitch. They ate, ate that fucking top tier, bitch. Fucking love it. And the third movie that I consider one of my favorites is Child's Play simply because it's camp to the highest degree. And I watched the entire series 
almost faithfully every year for Halloween. I can still quote that scene in the first movie <laughs> where Karen, Andy's mom, grabs Chucky, you know, the doll. And she says, I said, talk to me, damn it, or I'll throw you in the fire. And he's like, you stupid bitch. You feel like the way he comes up and he starts fighting her. And the reason why I love that scene so much is because it's so funny to me to think of the actor, like how many takes it took her to pretend like this doll that's maybe for, I, I don't know how big, but it's not that big. Oh! <laughs> so that shit is so funny to me. But what do you think, Daquan? Um, have you ever seen the movies I mentioned just now? Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> we have this conversation a lot <laughs> off camera. We do. But there are so many times when Andre makes a movie reference, and I laugh, I'll chuckle along <laughs> like I get it. But I fully never seen never it. watched it. <laughs> never. Watched I don't know who that it. movie is. Sorry, I don't that know. Movie. If it was right in front of me, I couldn't tell. I'm sorry to this movie. <laughs> but I've never I've never seen those. They do sound any of them? Any of them. Damn, Girl, big one. None of them. We're gonna have don't worry, like, y'all. We're doing a movie. We're gonna do some movie nights with Daquan right. and Daquan called we're, up. They we're going to see about it. <laughs> but I did now that we've been talking about it and then another another movie came to my mind. <laughs> I'm like, girl, I can't. I can't move on without saying this, but Moonlight oh, was yeah, such yeah. a phenomenal film. I think that just, I love being represented. Yeah. I love seeing blackness. I love seeing queerness, but seeing black queerness on screen, mm -hmm. seeing this play of masculinity and its intimacies was so refreshing to see. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I, I love any movies that either make me happy, make me feel seen, or make me just forget about the world that we live in and can live in this little fantasy land. Right. Now, so many children grow up never knowing the full scope of what their culture has contributed to society and history. So it's time for a change. Let's take a pause, rewind, and remind the world just how we did that. In an article written on history.com, we learn that Misty Copeland, born September 10th, 1982 in Kansas City, Missouri, is an American ballet dancer who in 2015 became the first African-American female principal dancer with the American Ballet Theater. In 2001, she became a member of the ABTS court Core de Ballet, the only African-American woman in a group of 80 dancers. Though she was challenged by her difference, not only in skin color, but also in body type, always more full-figured than her peers, she nevertheless climbed the ranks by virtue of her exceptional skill. In 2007, she became the company's first African-American female soloist in two decades. Copeland's inspiring story made her a role model and a pop icon. In 2009, Copeland appeared in a music video for the song Crimson and Clover by Prince. She also performed live with him on his tour the following year. Copeland became a strong advocate for diversifying the field of ballet and creating access for dancers of varying racial and economic backgrounds. She served on the advisory committee for the ABT's Project Plie, a program offering training and mentorship to dance teachers in racially diverse communities around the country, as well as in boys and girls clubs. Copeland published a memoir, Life in Motion, an Unlikely Ballerina, in 2014 and had endorsements with companies such as Coach and Under Armour. In June 2015, the ABT chose Copeland as its first African-American female principal dancer in the company's 75-year history. In August of that year, she had her Broadway debut in the role of Ivy Smith in Leonard Bernstein's musical, On the Town. Black women. Black women, black first. 
black first. <laughs> and it's also crazy that we're you talking about this because for a long time, I thought that Misty Copeland did that a long time ago. Right. Girl, yeah, no, yeah. That was only 2015. That was only 20. Yeah. <laughs> it feels it, yeah, yeah. According to blackpast.org, Benny Jean Prim, a pioneer in HIV AIDS research and treatment and an anesthesiologist, was born on May 28th, 1928 in Williamson, West Virginia. In 1948, Prim transferred to West Virginia State College, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in education, concentrating in pre-med, biological science, and German. After graduating from West Virginia State, he entered the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant. Prim was one of the first Black officers to command white troops after President Harry Truman integrated the U.S. military in 1948. After fulfilling his military obligations, Prim was honorably discharged in 1953 and then traveled to Germany to study pharmacology. Starting in 1963, Prim worked as a weekend emergency room anesthesiologist at Harlem Hospital. In 1969, he founded the Addiction Research and Treatment Corporation, now called Start Treatment and Recovery Centers in Brooklyn. In 1981, Prim launched the Urban Resource Institute to protect spouses from domestic violence. Two years later in 1983, through behavior observation and testing, he connected the relationship between IV substance abuse and AIDS and discovered that the disease among Black Americans far outnumbered the reported cases in the LGBTQ community. Prim was a medical consultant to three U.S. presidents, including serving on Ronald Reagan's Presidential Commission on the Human Immunodeficiency Virus Epidemic in 1987. He was also one of the creators of the 1998 Congressional Minority AIDS Initiative, where millions of dollars were allocated to serve HIV and AIDS minority populations. He later became an advisor for the Center for Disease Control, CDC. Among the Black Firsts, I heard another Black First. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first okay bad bitch things bad bitch mm -hmm. things we love we love some educated blackness period <laughs> now as always thank you all so much for watching and keep the conversation going down in the comment box below don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and if you are listening to us on our podcast please rate and review on whatever platform you're using you can also follow our podcast on instagram and tiktok at the melanin margin for updates of new content and if you'd like to follow each of us, our handles are at Daquan M-U-E. And at Andre Talks A Lot. Now, we will see you all next time on The Melanin Margin, where our goal is always to bring the marginalized to the spotlight in any way we can. Goodbye now. <laughs>